I beat my father at chess for the first time when I was 12, and at first I thought it meant that I was brilliant. I danced around the kitchen, skidding in my socks, taunting him with his fallen king, and it seemed unlike him not to laugh. My mother poked her head in to see what the yelling was about, and I said gleefully, I beat dad at chess. My mother looked at my father, who was poring over the chessboard, his cheeks sucked in, his eyebrows clenched. Did you let her win, Frank? Did you, Dad? I said, insulted. I sat down at the table and fiddled with the knights. They were my favorite because they were best for sneak attacks. You didn't, did you? No, my father said, packing up the pawns, settling them in their foam for what turned out to be forever. No, I would never do something like that. But how many of us would want somebody posthumously sifting through our past, looking for the first misstep? In retrospect, anybody's eccentricities, charms, and mistakes can take on a darker dimension and become foreshadowing. All we can know is that my father's mind was gone by anyone's standards by the time he was 40. So I do not think my projections for myself are overly pessimistic. If you're interested in stories about what can be done in a short lifetime, the history of chess is not a bad place to look. It's populated almost entirely by people who were at their best when they were barely out of adolescence. There's Bobby Fischer, of course, so that story ends badly, with lunacy, exile in Iceland, and anti-Semitism. And Alexander Alexandrovich Aoki, so that story ends badly too, with alcoholism, erratic behavior, and more anti-Semitism. Then there's Alexander Kimovich Bezatov, who was the USSR chess champion by the time he was 19, and the world chess champion by the time he was 22. His is a sad story, too, in some ways, although I didn't know that when I went, ran away to Russia to find him. I'm going to skip ahead a couple of pages. My father must have felt his share of isolation and resentment in the years preceding his final declension from Huntington's. Maybe that was what made him come to view Alexander Bezitov as some kind of kindred spirit. Or maybe it was something else, the idea of youth trumping obsolescence or intellect trumping entropy. My father was a man who loved his own mind and knew that one day he would lose it. That's what made Alexander his hero, perhaps. Here was a person whose neurological circuitry was so luminescent that it shone through seven time zones on a Cold War. Here was a person who knew the value of his own intelligence and the shortness of its reign. One winter night when I was seven, I had a fever so high that the shadows became animals against the wall and the room spun slowly around me. It was snowing and the snowflakes caught the streetlight and turned red and I was filled with the vague, generalized anxiety of being sick and a child. I went downstairs, and my father was sitting with a glass of bourbon. Through the television static, two dark, angry-looking men were playing chess at a table. Dad, I said, shivering uncontrollably through my fever. Look at this, he said, come here. I sat on his lap, sweating into his lapel with my fever head. The men on the television were hard to make out through the snow. They were gray and amorphous, crackling with every move, the ghosted relics of another universe. Where are they? Russia, that's very far away. It's a huge country east of Europe. They look far away, I said. Is it cold there? The room the men were in had a cold light to it. There was a silence between them that felt full and fierce, as though if you listened carefully enough, you might hear in the static, silent talk, taunts and dares and ruminations. The younger of the two men scratched his chin and sacrificed a bishop. Look at him, my father said, putting his finger right on the television, in violation of the rule of my mother's. He's 22, you know. The man he touched had a face that was gray and gaunt, but also tautly intelligent. He touched the pieces with a furious energy that bordered on recklessness. His opponent handled his pieces carefully, nearly caressing the bishops before moving them letting his fingers linger for a split second on the move he had just made. The young man scratched his head vigorously, moved his queen with an offhand impatience. He's going to be the youngest chess champion in the world, my father said wonderingly. The muted men stared at each other, and we stared at them. My father stroked my forehead, and I felt tired, but I wanted to stay awake so I could remember whatever it was my father wanted me to remember. Time seemed to collapse. The only sound was the crackle of the static, and we watched for what must have become a very long time until the final moves were made 
a tipping point beyond which all was inevitable. I've since studied this game, how Alexander sacrificed his black rook, which was consumed almost greedily by Rusev's white knight, and then swung his other rook, which had been lurking idly on the other end of the board, huddled like a creature, forgotten by the audience and, presumably, the old man, down to the end of the board. At the time, all I knew was that my father was wrapped. He leaned forward slightly. In the monochromatic eastern light, Alexander cracked his knuckles. His opponent's king lay sideways on the black tiling, dead. Maybe there was the faintest rustle of a gasp in the audience. Or maybe I'm imagining that part. But I know what my father said afterward, even though I still wonder whether he was telling me the truth. You see, he said, turning off the television with a flash that made bright spots in my eyes. The red snowflakes kept coming, slower and slower. My father spoke so quietly that I wasn't sure whether he was talking to himself or to me. You see, he said, and I shivered again, you can do a lot before you are 30. Thank you. <laughs>